Recently, Pastor Benny had the privilege of hosting the Praise the Lord program for the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Today's guests are Pat Boone, former Congressman Bob McEwen, and his wife Liz. On This Is Your Day, we decided to share with you these thought-provoking truths about our American heritage and our country's well-being. Former Congressman Bob McEwen explains it in profoundly simple terms. Now sit back and enjoy this time together as we join the broadcast in progress. You are going to be amazed, all of you, by what this man of God, and he is a man of God, what he is going to say to us tonight. He just spoke at Liberty University, and we were told it was the best they've ever had. And you were telling me something about that. Oh, I, I got a CD of it, and I was jumping up and down, and I was in the car, which was a dangerous. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I you, mean, it's one wait, of the wait, wait, wait. You were jumping up yeah, and down, I, and I, oh, oh, whoa, hallelujah, whoops, I got to be. Uh, because, because it is one of the most compact, substantive, thrilling speeches I've heard, and man, if it doesn't make what you proud. What did he say, by the way, just so... Well, it was about 40 minutes, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he, he talks about what the has headlines. made America yeah. great, what makes any nation great, mm -hmm. and what will do the reverse, what will inhibit nations and peoples, and it is freedom. Mm -hmm. It is freedom that makes people great, and, and the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right. You're not going to find it anywhere else and Bob makes that I'm plain. very impressed but by what I'm reading former six-term United States congressman from Ohio chairman of the environmental affairs task force of US del of US delegation to European Parliament a member of the US Congress select committee on intelligence and house committee on rules and you were the official observer in Moscow in 1991 Mm -hmm. when the Soviet coup uh, attempt there took over, uh, uh, actually happened. And um, senior advisor, my goodness, I mean... I'm an old man. Yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that. May I say one yes, thing about... Yes, ma'am, Liz, of course. About Bob, he has the talent or the gift to take very complicated issues and make them simple. And that's what mm -hmm. Pat was saying with that speech. That's, that's because right. he, he calls it politics easy as pie. And, you know, it's kind of a cute title, but... He always said, I'd like to gear it to a young woman who maybe has two kids who doesn't care about it, and all of a sudden she'll say, I got it. And that's his gift. He takes these issues. And well, we're, we're all concerned about America mm -hmm. and the future. And I want to hear from you about why we as Christians should support Israel. Well, God identified it a long time ago, made the pro promise to, to Abram. And if you may remember when he made a covenant, uh, when you make a covenant, you, you take the calf and you slide it from top to bottom, and you separate the two, and then you, and you walk between it. And Abram said to him, he says, you're going to promise me this land. How do I know that? And, and God said immediately, bring me a heifer. Well, when you and I sell property, I, I can promise verbally to paint this room. That can be a contract. But you can't transfer property without signing a contract. And if you were to sell me a house, the first word I would say is, well, bring me a, a pen. Bring me a piece of paper. And when, when God said, that, bring me a heifer, I'm going to make a covenant with you, with my people, and this land shall be yours. And it, it has been, and, and the wise people are the O's that, that get on God's side. Uh, God wins in these debates. <laughs> and it's, it's wise for, for America. And so when the time came that uh, they wanted to reform the nation, the ship Exodus, this land is mine, God gave this land to me. And uh, when uh, Pat Boone helped people understand what was happening there, the United States of America, they declared independence. The United States of America recognized it, and the entire world then had to fall behind because they said the United States is going to stand with them. And periodically, they make a run. They try to destroy that nation. 67 was a prominent one. The Yom Kippur War, in which in 73 they, they made the greatest advances. The United States of America came to its defense. The president wanted to use our supplies that were just right next door in the Middle East and throughout Europe. And every one of those nations said no. And so the only way that we could use our supplies on our air bases in Germany, in, in Britain, in uh, Italy, elsewhere, they wouldn't let us use any of those supplies to help Israel. And the United States of America flew them from, from our shores across the ocean, landing and refueling 
at the Azores and taking them in and supporting that nation. Then the President of the United States called the best friend America ever had. And it was the leader of the Middle East, which has been there since Darius and Daniel uh, were running the place in Persia, and now called Iran. And we asked if the airplanes that have been purchased from the United States, the F-14s, that the Israeli pilots knew how to fly, they had lost their air force in the Yom Kippur War in the first six hours. They didn't think they were going to be attacked. They were all sitting down to dinner, and that's when they were attacked overnight, and their air force was killed, was destroyed in place. And so for the next three days, they had no air cover, and they were pleading with the United States to come help them. The United States cannot declare war. The president doesn't have the capacity to do that. And so he asked the Shah of Iran if he would give his planes to Israel. He agreed to do it without promise of replacement or remuneration. Wow. And with that, began to, to turn turn the battle. So it's it's a place that uh, the, the scripture has said certain things will will happen. Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So after after a couple of thousand years, you think well maybe that wasn't going to happen. When God says something, it happens. And the wise state is one that gets on His side. And the United States has consistently done that. I shudder to think how many hours Israel would survive if the United States did not keep its word as its friend. What can be done with Iran? Well, I I Iran, as I mentioned, had always been with the United States. And once the Shah cast all of his cards with the United States in 1973 to save Israel, he sealed his fate with the radical mullahs. But he decided with the United States. So, you know, he, he was trustworthy. We'd always been friends. And then we voted for change in 1976. And the, the president that took over at that time uh, a fellow from Georgia, uh, yeah. he said that he felt that uh, the Shah should step down, which in diplomatic terms means we're not going to honor our word. And so with that, all the international corporations, we, we, we then put sanctions on, that is that we, we wouldn't deal with them. And so the international corporations began withdrawing their personnel. And then they, they said, well, who's going to take over? Uh, the Shah's not leaving, so we think the Shah should step down. The President of the United States, his closest friend and ally, walked out into the, to the Rose Garden and said he should leave. And they said, well, who's going to take his place? And our uh, spokesman in, at the United Nations said, well, the United States thinks that Khomeini might be a saint. Can you, did you hear that? Would you mind there's repeating that? There's many of us that, that remember the, the occasion. That, that, that is the United shocking. States anointed this man who... who anointed who, Khomeini. Khomeini and said, we think he might be a saint. A man oh that, that... And then... Did Congress you know that? Uh, I, I only had a vague recollection because I wasn't paying that much attention to that, but I now know that what happened after that were 73 Americans were taken hostage in Tehran right. and during the presidency and uh, and it was the downfall of that president that's correct he was he was uh, then followed by a man that you remind me a lot of a man named Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. and though every one of those imprisoned Americans came home safely well now let's talk about what's going on in America because mm -hmm. I want to focus on that and you had said something about what was said at Liberty, and I'd like to hear it from the congressman. Please, sir. Well, it's all yours. I'll tell you, just, let's just take a step back and just look at America. Here is a place, 4% of the population of the world, and yet uh, people had hoped to fly for thousands of years, but it was Americans that invented the, the airplane and the light bulb and the telephone and the telegraph and the global positioning system and the internet. Uh, more inventions than the rest, the other 96% combined, the rest of the world combined. Every year we have more copyrights, more books, more plays, more symphonies, more inventions than the rest of the world combined. And you, we, we love to talk about poverty. Uh, we just love to say, uh, you know, take pictures of black and white and tell how horrible it is in America. And so uh, Mr. Huckabee would love us doing this. If we wanted to say real genuine poverty, how about the Ozarks in, in Arkansas? We, we would say there they are. Well, the sixth largest nation on earth is, is uh, Pakistan. 168 million people. The gross domestic product, the wealth that's generated by the little state of Arkansas, is greater than the sixth largest nation on earth. <laughs> you say, well, but wait, what I saw there in Katrina, you know, in New Orleans, why, why not everybody's wealthy? Well, okay, the fourth largest nation on earth, the nation where the president grew up. He spoke to the classes the other day. He talked to the school children, reminded them that when he was growing up, he grew up in, in, in Indonesia. And they're the fourth largest nation on earth, a major oil producer. The gross domestic product of that entire nation is smaller than the state of Louisiana. And it's 300 million people. 300 million people. 91 million uh, Filipinos produce less wealth every year 
than the three million Oklahomans. Listen to this. We speak of Russia. Russia is a great country. Of the, it's a major oil producer, a major gold producer, provi provides most of the natural gas for Europe. Of the seven major strategic metals, it's number one in five, number two in one, number three in one. Uh, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Rachmaninoff, this great nation, the largest nation on earth, almost larger than the next two combined, China and Canada, and the gross domestic product of that entire nation is smaller than the state of New Jersey. Now, we have to... <laughs> let that sink in. Yeah, please let it sink that's in. Why, that's why I was shouting in the car. This nation is an abundantly blessed wonderful place. This is the place that people hope to oh, yeah. Oh, keep talking to us. <laughs> so now we have to ask the question, why is that? Well, uh, the, the reason is not that complicated. There's only two things that you vote on. You, Liz mentioned politics easiest pie, and, and we have it available. P equals I plus E. Politics equals integrity. That's right and wrong plus economics. Economics is how much taxes you take from people. So when you and I enter into a contract, we give our word. And so for 200 years, we've had plastered on every schoolroom, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Now, coveting is when you want what somebody else has. Americans have never done that in the past. We, Liz would always ask people when we travel the world, and they would say, uh, you know, I've been to America, I've been to America. And she would say, well, what impressed you the most about America? And the answer that come back more than any other is, you know, in America, you don't have walls around your properties. And it's the only place on earth where we don't have walls around our property. You say, your, your yards just flow into another yard. Why? Because we don't <laughs> covet anybody else's. When we see a nice car going down the street and you're 14 years old, you don't say, someday I'm going to take that guy's car. You say, someday I want to have a car like that. And see that big, beautiful house? Someday I'm going to work hard. I want a house like that. And so throughout Latin America, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout all these places, you have to have walls. If you want to go to dinner, you have to have someone protect your house while you're gone. So the integrity part. Now, why is that? Well, our founding fathers, when they got together, uh, they wanted to have 13 individual countries that had been for 10 years, hadn't been doing so well. They met back in Philadelphia, the same place where they wrote the, Const wrote the Declaration of Independence 12 years before. And they tried to form a constitution, and they couldn't agree. 50% of the people lived in three states, 50% lived in 10 states, big states and little states didn't want, and they couldn't agree, and they're about to break apart after five and a half weeks. And as they're starting to leave and the whole thing is giving up, Benjamin Franklin, one of only four that had been in that room when they wrote the Declaration a decade before, he spoke for the first time. He's 83 years old. He has a gout. And, uh, but he, had, he, said, he got up to speak and asked everyone's attention. He said, I am an old man. He said, but one thing I have learned is that God deals in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall without his notice, is it likely that an empire could rise without his aid? He said, when we had, had a battle here before, we began every day with prayer. And, and get this, it's only been 12 years. He said, but have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we determine we no longer need him? He said, I believe that the scripture says that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so he said, I believe we shall be no more successful in this political building than were the builders of Babel said, therefore, let us call upon God and let us see what God might do. And so with that, they recessed. They had three days of fasting and prayer. And then they met back the following Monday. And over the next six weeks, Benning, they wrote the Constitution of the United States of America, creating the oldest government on earth. Every government on earth has changed a myriads of times. France has done it seven times. Poland, 17. The list goes on and on. The United States has never. Made the oldest government on earth. And so they said, you know, this is a good thing. Let's make sure that we understand where our strength came from. Therefore, Congress shall never meet. And from that day until this, Congress has never met for one second without first calling upon God in prayer. And let us understand where our strength comes from. There, a person taking a position of public trust, whether it be dog catcher or president of the United States, will first swear allegiance on a covenant, first swear allegiance on the Bible. And, said, and then in all official documents, so that we don't forget this, and, and when the president uh, just did something recently for, for a religious group, at the end of that official document, as everyone does, it says, done in this, the year of our Lord, the 2009th, 
and of the independence of the United States of America, the 233rd. So that regardless of what we're talking about, regardless of building a dam or a highway or planting trees, or whatever, when you're all finished, remember, if it's an official document, that this was done in the year of our Lord, so they would understand from whence our strength comes. Now, these people that came here poor, <laughs> they always talk about poverty in America, People did not sell their castles, get in their clipper ships, and come over here to eke out an existence in the forest. The people that came here were all poor. They came here with nothing. They came here for looking for freedom. And from that freedom, we have blessed the nation that whenever a tsunami hits any place, whenever there is an earthquake, whenever there is help, to whom do they turn? They don't turn to the United Nations. They don't turn to Paris. They don't turn to any. When Israel and Egypt were going to sign an agreement, and we want to have an official place that the whole world can see. Now, the United States is not a part of it. This is Egypt and Israel, one of form. Where is the most respected spot on the planet? Again, would it, would it be any of the other places you would think of? They wanted to go to the lawn of the White House because this is the standard for righteousness in the, in the world, which makes it a source of attack. And for those that want to destroy it, we need to be very cautious that those of us who love it do not join in that chorus and pointing at the flaws that all of us have. You get a large enough magnifying glass and put it on your cheek, you're going to say, that person's not very attractive. And so, <laughs> so, so we need to understand that we need to focus on what America stands for and what it's doing and not focus on its flaws. Oh. We are moved by what you're saying to all of us. Yeah. We love it. Now, <laughs> America's future, sir. How can America stay strong? Winston Churchill, a uh, young man, he was talking to him, and he said, a young man said, I want to be involved in government. He said, what do, I, what do I do? And Winston Churchill said, study history, study history, study history, for in it you will find all of the secrets of statecraft. Now, there are th certain things that our founders understood, and they took this barren spot, and created more wealth than the rest of the world combined. So therefore, what they taught might be a good thing. What, in, the, in the course of where we're headed, it's important for all of us to understand what those strengths were. And let me just mention about evangelical believers. Please. Half of all of the people, the 65 million people who identify themselves as evangelical believers. Not the 280 million that say that they're Christian, but the people that, that believe in, in a relationship with Christ and, and the, the validity of the scriptures, etc. Half of those are not registered to vote. Yeah. Half of those that are registered to vote do not vote. So of the one-fourth that do vote, they are split 38 to 42 percent on one side, 55 to 60 on the other side which means that demographically, if you're a political candidate and you're going to look at this group that votes 95 percent on one side, whether, whether it be the special interest groups that we're familiar with, certainly in California, or the inner city or whatever group votes as a block, and you look at the evangelical group, you think, okay, they're not going to make much of a difference because they're not registered and they don't show up, and when they do, they split their vote. Now, let me tell you the facts. 23 million Americans are considered themselves members of unions. They're constantly encouraged to be registered to vote. There are other smaller groups like that. But of this group, 55 million votes elects all 100 senators, all 50 governors, all 435 House members of the president. You take those 55, you can elect everything. 65 million people say they're evangelical. If, if that group that doesn't show up, doesn't register and doesn't show up, if it starts to take a little bit of interest at all and just twitches, I'm talking three to five million, if they just got out of the pew and into the voting booth for 15 minutes once every two years, this nation could be saved in a minute. Yeah. 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 Good God. Let it be, Lord. <laughs> so how can we... What can we do to talk to these dear people? What you're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is America. Yeah. Yeah. We need to vote in America. Look, I was born in Israel. I am proud to be an American. You know, when I read the Constitution, I cried. Hmm. I did. Because it so moved me. I thought, wow, this is from God. Yeah. You, I, only God could have given those men right. the kind right. of hearts they had to write that. Mm -hmm. Precious people, please, I beg you, if, if I need to, I'll come to your house and just, <laughs> well, I am in your house right now. 
I'll say two things on that. Yes, sir. Number please. one, in order in order to register to vote, there you can go online and do it very very easily. It takes somewhere between 30 and 60 seconds. Your name, your address, and 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 uh, your date of birth, and you can do it at any. Uh, board of Elections, where you get your driver's license, just any of those places. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, we have been lovingly handed this great opportunity after 200 years. If this generation drops it, I think we're going to be held accountable for, for what we have, we have done. Uh, in, in addition, you talking about reading the Constitution. The uniqueness of America, see, is that we supported, we hold these truths. Now, just that will get you, deny you tenure at most colleges. Truth. Yeah. We believe we hold these truths to be self-evident, which is a gracious Jeffersonian way of saying any idiot ought to understand this. <laughs> we, we, yeah. hold, we hold these truths to be self-evident, <laughs> that all men are created. Let that sit for a second. Yeah. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among those are life then liberty, then the pursuit of happiness. See, life, life is, is first. See, liberty isn't much value if you're dead. So you, you have to have life first. Life, then liberty, then the right to pursue happiness. Life is a spiritual question. Liberty is a political question. Pursuit of happiness is an economic question. Liberty has three stools. It has three, three prongs on the stool. It is spiritual liberty, economic liberty, and political liberty. You can't be free unless you have all three. If, if one of them is lost, if you're, if you're a multimillionaire but you're in jail, then you're, 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 you're not free. But if, you, uh, if you're out free and you don't have any money, the little five-year-old says to his mother, I'm fed up, I'm leaving, and he grabs his teddy bear and storms out the door, she can watch him out the window knowing he's not going anyplace. Why? Because he doesn't have any economic freedom. He, he's as tethered to that house as if he were tied. Now, it, had, had he said, oh, by the way, I took $500 out of your purse and your credit card and I believe that would be different. So in, order, <laughs> so in order to be free, you have to be spiritually free, you have to be politically free, and you have so. to be economically free. And America had the, the spiritual ingredient. France did not have that. And wherever you don't have the tie to God, you don't protect life. And that's the best way to find it out. So the, the symbol of the French uh, uh, Revolution was the guillotine. They cut off their heads. When Hitler took over in Germany, 12 million killed, 6 million Jews, 6 million Catholic priests and others. Stalin, 30 to 60 million. Uh, Pol Pot, 2 and a half million in Cambodia. Uh, che Guevara, the college kids go around wearing the picture with Fidel Castro, 400,000 Cubans. And we don't know how many in, in, in China. Always death. See, sin is anything that separates us from God. And when you separate yourself from God, the wages of sin, anything separated from God, the wages of sin is death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, mm -hmm. but the end thereof are the ways of death. What are the ways of death? Abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, right to die legislation, drug addiction, alcoholism, death. Sin, when it is conceived, bringeth forth death. So what is sin? Anything that separates us from God. However, Christ said, I am come that you might have life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that hath the Son hath life. And so you have a life and death struggle. And it's abundantly clear. So why would these people strike so vigorously to take under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance? What's that to them? Why do they care about if it's, if it's on, on our coins? Why do they get offended if the Boy Scouts honor God and country? Why? Because they want to separate us from God. And once you're separated from God, then you're just like any other country on earth. That's the unique tie that our founders wanted to make abundantly clear to make sure you didn't miss it. And if you do this, you will be blessed. And it has been blessed, and that's the spiritual battle that if we sit idly by and allow it to be stolen out from under us, I fear we shall give account. Mm -hmm. And we'll pay the price. We'll pay the price. <laughs> Congressman, what do we do as Christians? Please look at the camera and talk to our people. God's people. Registering to vote in the churches, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, our friend Jerry Falwell had, had a great system that twice a year when he would be preaching, uh, in the, uh, talking about stewardship and responsibility and all, and then he would mention that, in fact, our nation has been entrusted to us and the stewardship of this nation. And, and the little thing that's asked of us is that at least we show up to vote. That's, that's the very minimal. In fact, how many of you are registered to vote? Tell me, how many, everybody's registered, stand up, stand up. So Jerry would have everybody that, that was sitting down, he would have the ushers come down with the voter registration cards. 
and he would pass out to anyone sitting down the voter registration card. Maybe they just moved and, and, or something. Yeah, they they new, new to the area or, or sure. whatever. And so he, he would say, now I'm in the middle of my sermon. I don't have time for this. This isn't complicated. It's your name, your address, your birth date. Sign it. Let's go. And then he has the ushers turn around and pick it up as they go back up the aisle. Because otherwise, they'd be in their Bible three years from now. So <laughs> they, gotta make, they have to yeah, make sure exactly. that they do it. He would do it twice a year. And if we, would just, if we would just do that, when people get to the polls, they tend to know how to vote. Uh, they tend to know what to, what to do that, that's right. It's just the frustration is that we don't get there. But, but I, I also want to ask, as God's people, and you are a Christian, and you are a very strong Christian. What can we do as God's people in America? So, and please, look at the camera and talk to them. Well, uh, the Scripture says specifically to pray for those in authority, to understand that this is a spiritual battle, that there are those who want to, to turn the head of America, because, as I mentioned, Scripture says that to, to take a city, you must bind a strong man. The strong man for the world is the United States. If America crumbles, there is nobody to stop Denmark, wonderful country, the entire navy consists of three minesweepers. So uh, the, the, these nations are dependent upon the American people to keep the world safe but, and but stable. But you, 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 you just said something important. It is a spiritual battle. Yes, it is. Why? Because the United States stands for righteousness. It's, it says, for when you give your word, you should keep it. So that's why radicals are they trying to hurt America. Absolutely. No doubt about so we as God's people, besides praying for our leaders, what else? Well, the stand with Israel is obviously a, a wise run thing to do. Office. And mm -hmm. they can run for office. Uh, they, Listen, yeah. I, I want to hear from your <laughs> wife about that. I want to hear what she has to say. Well, it is really important for God's kids to run God's country and to run for office. So, so will your husband ever... Uh, <laughs> she's not going to say anything. I'm praying one day he'll run for office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really important, and it's really important to get people who understand history. And this is Bob's mission right now. He's, he gave 20 years of elective office in the state and in the nation. And now his goal is to educate all of, all of us, and I'm, one of, I'm his best student, to educate them to history to what it takes to run for office. And those of us who don't put our name on the ballot, we are there to support them, um, to show up to a, a fundraiser and give $25, 50 $100 to the candidate so they can go out and do the things they have to do. It's hard work, but we want to get the candidates who understand why they're there. And we've seen many in Congress who are happy if they're in Congress, but they don't have a clue as to what is at stake. And somehow they, they got in. And you can elaborate. And one of the best that. places to start would be a school board. Yeah, because uh -oh. there's a handful of people that know about that, and they, you go down, it usually takes about five signatures to get your name on the ballot, and then it's a matter of asking eight or ten or fifteen people to support you. Most people don't know who's running for school board. They don't know who's on the school board. So those that want to do away with Christmas, that want to do away with being able to sing Christmas carols or do whatever, those that want, you say, how does this happen? It happened because we allowed it to slip through our fingers. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not, uh, there are many city council seats. There are many, there are many school board seats that three, 500 votes a person wins. And uh, you get 50 people, you get 10 folks, you could, you, could, you could do that. And it's something not only we can do, we have to do it. And you know mm -hmm. what? Oh, please, well, I was, uh, another thing about candidates. One time I was sitting at a table just at a banquet and some guy knew nothing about politics said, how could I get involved in something like this? Oh, that was music to my ears. I said, did you know that a congressman, you always hear this committee to reelect so-and-so, you think there's 100 people. I said, it's usually about three. Three or four people who are committed to putting up yard signs, and when they're torn down, you put them up again. Somebody who's in the office to answer the phone. It's really three to five people. And I said to this guy, you could be one of those three. And sure enough, he is, his life has changed. He's now full-time <laughs> in politics. He was a young man in his Good. 30s, um, and it's amazing. He ran a statewide race in Kansas and, yes. and is now uh, in, in Washington. You're, you're exactly right that, that it's not that complicated. It does take a little bit of work, which sometimes frightens people off. But then you have to ask, is, it, is this greatest hope of mankind worth a little sacrifice a couple times a year? You said something in the car that was so powerful to me about the importance that the people should raise their voice. Mm -hmm. You know, you can influence these politicians, 
Okay. Please talk about it. You need that. to understand. Uh, that you, think that, that you think that politicians can't be reached. That's like walking into a store and telling the owner of the store, I think that looks like a mess over there. I don't care how rich he is or how many stores he has, he hears that. And he knows it and he takes cognizance of it. Politicians listen to voters for a living. And you say, well, my letter doesn't matter. Please don't think that's, that's the truth. They listen very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. And Russell Kirk said in one of his last books, he said, politicians are actors performing a script that's written by the audience. And they know exactly how far they can go. You say, we elected this great man. Why didn't he do more? He knows just how far he can go because the audience control, he can get fired at the next intermission. And so he can't, we, he can't lecture the audience. The audience controls. Now, who understands that? Hollywood understands that. Yeah. That's why all those miserable television programs that I, if I forced you to sit and watch some evening and you couldn't get your way through it, but if you made yourself do it, you would listen to all of these little asides about America and who is the person that, that is the crook and the thief. It happens to be the, 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 the minister or the priest. And who's the person that's the really genuine and opening? It's the person that's the, it, it, it just turning America to the little, little ones. Now, what do we have to do? We have, you and I, the audience. We need to make sure that we control the stage. And the next time somebody runs for office and they tell us, I think this nation that has been abundantly blessed with the greatest coal reserves in the world, with the greatest oil reserves within the top three to five nations of the entire world with oil reserves, we import a million and a half barrels a day. We could get a million barrels tomorrow just from known reserves. We could, we could produce mm -hmm. them by the end of this year if we yeah. wanted to. Uh, and plus there's, there's many, many more. There's no reason for our nation to be dependent on politicians who say we have to go on our knees to ask somebody halfway around the world to take care of us. Now, why are they able to do that? Because I perfect example. I'm glad I thought of this. Please yeah. tell us. I want to hear it. <laughs> you want to know why? You want to know why that is? Because there's a little handful of people that while you're helping in, in, in your Sunday school class and while you're heading the Cub Scouts and helping the Boy Scouts and while you're making... Uh, making your bills and, and working and doing other things, there's a handful of little folks that have nothing to do. And they say, I'm going to save the environment. And the way I'm going to save the environment is I want everybody here, around here that farms or goes to a job, I want to put them out of their job and I want to tell them you can't, you can't produce anything new and I'm going to stand on America's oxygen hose until it crumples. Because this nation, no matter how many games they've tried to play, America keeps figuring out a way to come out on top. And they're getting frustrated. And the only way they can do it is to absolutely suffocate us by saying that you cannot drill for any energy, you cannot use any water for any energy, you can't make a dam, you can't do all the things that made America successful for 200 years. And who are they? They aren't as many people as in this room right here tonight. And they're the ones that show up at the city council meeting. They're the ones that intimidate them to do those silly regulations that don't let it happen. Why? Because we're busy doing the other things. Now, you said, what can we do? We're the big gorilla. We are tens of millions that believe that this nation is blessed of God, that, it, that we believe in righteousness, we believe in, in those kind of people being in office. If we show up, those little two or three hundred people that walk around with their spines and intimidate that little tiny city council, where you and I should be, by the way, we should be sitting there on the city council, where, where we wouldn't be in this mess.